Hi, this is Guy Burgess. For this post, I'd like to talk about the mechanics of actually implementing massively parallel piece building, and in particular, how you use the action list that we talked about earlier. And instead of talking in general terms, I'd like to talk about how you do this or use all of this to address a specific conflict. And the conflict I have in mind is the one that I think is on the top of most people's minds, at least in the United States, is something that we might call the authoritarian populism conflict. At any rate, more about that in a minute. Uh, but as you may remember, the sort of theory of change underlying massively parallel peace building is this notion that people are increasingly understanding the urgency of the conflict problem and they want to help. But unlike following a natural disaster, they don't quite know what to do. It's hard to identify the things that need doing, find out whether they're actually being done so you don't duplicate effort, and what they can do, what each person can do to help, and how they can learn how to do it if they don't know already. So we want to try to apply those ideas here. Um, so again, the mechanics of massively parallel peace building start with a sort of introductory series of posts that outline the nature of the intractable conflict problem and especially the challenges posed by scale and complexity. Then you have an action list, which is really a very substantial menu of all of the things that need to be done. And then within the context of each of those, you have descriptions of each massively parallel peace building action. As you may remember, we organize all of this around, first of all, a series of 10 challenges. And then within each of those 10 challenges, a list of specific actions that are presented in kind of a checklist format. The idea is you go down the list of challenges and then you go down the list of actions within each challenge and look for places in which you might be able to make a contribution. Uh, for example, uh, the yellow highlighting, somebody might be interested in envisioning a future that everyone will want to live in and might focus in on the action item under challenge four. How can we imagine a realistic future in which the left and the right might both want to live rather than one winning or the other winning? Or an alternative is you might decide to focus in on the strategies for limiting or reversing the escalation spiral and try to get at this idea of hate and what are the dynamics that cause hate and how can you uh, break those down. So that's the sort of short end, except we have a big long list of actions. And ultimately what we need to do is to get lots of people working on different aspects of the problem. So as I mentioned, the example that I want to follow through and trying to show how this would all work is something that we call, and other people have called, but it's got lots of other names, authoritarian populism. And what we want to do is three things. One is to demonstrate the near-term usefulness of the MPP approach. I think a lot of the ideas that we'll lay out here are things that people could actually apply, like right now, and help make this pretty scary situation a whole lot less scary. Um, we also are using this to prioritize the development of the next phase of the massively parallel peace building project. So we're going to focus on adding next components that address this authoritarian populism problem. And then I want to see whether this whole idea really will work or really will make sense when we get into the context of a serious real world conflict. Now, before we get too far into this, I think a partisan disclaimer is in order. Uh, we've been talking a lot in earlier posts about the underlying goals of this whole uh, project, which is basically to strengthen and improve and promote democracy and resist the slide towards anocracy or anarchy, autocracy, tyranny, and war. And thinking back about when I first started teaching at the University of Colorado, um, I had to sign a pledge that I'd uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Colorado. That is, the first, the only thing that the university demanded was that I work to preserve and promote democracy. And to the extent that President Trump is acting in ways that pull away from that, I don't see that as partisan. I see it as trying to defend the whole democratic system. 
Uh, so there will be times here where we're pretty critical about the way things are going, uh, but it is in the context not of helping to support the democratic or the liberal, or for that matter, the conservative side of the debate. It's in the context of trying to make democracy work as a marketplace of ideas where we can have a continuing struggle between the various sides and a better society will emerge from that. Now, authoritarian populist movements are, at least in the U.S. media, uh, being reported in all sorts of places. Um, and a certain amount of humility here, I think, is in order. We know a fair amount about how this is playing out in the United States, and not a lot about how it's playing out in other countries, other than what we read in um, articles here, but we can't even begin to say that we're experts. So we'll rely on people from other countries to contribute to the various discussions. And I don't pretend to speak for the problems that other countries are facing, but still I think a lot of the dynamics and the things that need to be done here apply in lots of other places. I think we can make a pretty good case that this is one of the big challenges facing human society in the early 21st century. Um, now, in talking about authoritarian populism, it sort of takes place in the context of the left-right uh, divide over both cultural and distributional issues between Republicans and Democrats. Here are two slides of the Obama and Trump inauguration. All sort of look the same, but they're different people who care about different sets of things. And the conflict involving authoritarian populism is not a left-right conflict. It's different. And that's something that we'll delve into a lot more over the next series of posts. The other thing to be clear about is that popul this populist authoritarian conflict that we're talking about is, first of all, a populist revolt against establishment elites that tend to be clustered in the big cities on the coast, New York, Washington, San Francisco. Um, it's also not something that is a Republican thing or a Democratic thing, but it's a bipartisan revolt that you see uh, most notably with Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, but there are a lot of other populists on both sides that have lost faith in the establishment and the elites, and they have lots of good reasons for having lost faith. And there are lots and lots of articles that try to understand this uh, anger. And, you know, are the elites the solution? Or And these are all things, and there's some very interesting articles in the reference section here that, that start to get at this problem of populism. We still don't have it figured out. But the first part of this conflict is a very legitimate set of complaints about the way society's elites are managing things, and a lot of frustration about the failure of those elites to deal with real-world problems. And as I showed you in an earlier post, this is reflected not only in the United States, but all over the world, of a deterioration of support for democracy and support for authoritarianism and any one of a number of different flavors, whether it's a military strong leader or so-called experts of one sort or another. And again, I talked last earlier about the problem of Lord Acton's law that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So it's really important to, if you're going to abandon democracy, be very careful about how you do it. So the second half of this is, so you've got populism, and then you also have a push towards um, away from democracy and toward one of the three dystopias that we've talked about earlier, anocracy, autocracy, or war. And in particular, we're interested in autocracy because there are autocrats and autocratic wannabes, tyrant wannabes, plutocratic wannabes, that want to take advantage of the populist revolt in ways that will solidify their control or take control of a society. And the real conflict is whether or not we can stop these folks and still make democracy address the real grievances 
of the populace. And there are a lot of reasons to think that this is going to be the big dividing line of the 21st century. Uh, foreign Affairs has an interesting article that just came out that argued that a new high-tech artificial intelligence-based um, form of autocracy, uh, similar to what China's been developing with their dystopian technological system that's keeping track of absolutely everybody and giving them social credit scores. Um, that kind of authoritarianism is very, very different from that which we had under Stalin and Hitler. And how is it going to play out is uncertain. And certainly if democracy is going to survive, it's got to get a whole lot better at dealing with these conflicts. So the big issue here is how we deal with populism in the context of divide and conquer provocateurs. And these are the guys who are trying to take advantage of divisions within society, especially between the left and the right, and use that as a way of gaining control. And here, we're especially worried about the sort of scapegoating or hate-mongering technique, where by demonizing particular groups within society, a tyrant wannabe, first of all, gets to justify the ruthless and sometimes brutal repression of one's opponents. Uh, it also deflects blame that might come the autocrats or the uh, authoritarian's way because of corruption and mismanagement. You always blame it on the scapegoated group. And it also generates an intensifying, dehumanizing feedback loop where the two sides increasingly think of themselves as implacable mortal enemies that couldn't possibly imagine working together to, for example, combat the authoritarians that are trying to take over society. And again, this is a set of issues that's generated a whole lot of ink, or in the electronic days, I suppose, uh, bites. And here again are a selection of articles that I found especially useful on how this is actually playing out and what we have to do to defend ourselves against those uh, who would like to take control of the society. And it also raises the possibility that once authoritarianism takes hold, especially if supported by high technology, it may be very, very hard to dislodge. There are also a whole series of articles that look at the deliberate efforts on the part of Russia to pit Americans against one another as a way, perhaps, of um, solidifying Donald Trump's hold on power, or maybe a way of just promoting anarchy and weakening the United States and allowing them to do what they want to do. And in truth, the Russians have lots of good reasons uh, to be mad at us. But you see, in Mueller's indictments, especially the first round of indictments, a sort of systematic map of how very high-tech propaganda techniques are being used to drive us further apart. And so now our problem is how do we actually understand what's going on and address it. It's also important not to blame it all on Russia. Um, that what they're doing is the same sort of things that we've been doing to ourselves in an effort by various factions to gain power and authority over the society. And so the Russian contribution, we still don't know really what it was or how important it was, is still just another part of what's been happening otherwise. And part of this you see in the what you might call the mobilize the base dynamic. This is an interesting, very academic article from Sage about how over the last several elections, the winning combination turns out to be not persuading those in the middle, the so-called swing voters, that the left or the right offers a better way of governing society. Instead, what you both parties have been doing is mobilizing the base by making the base increasingly angry 
with the other side so angry that they couldn't possibly imagine that they'd win, so they all come out and vote. And whoever can mobilize the base most effectively is turning out to be uh, the folks that actually win. So uh, whenever I talk about something like this, I sort of have this strange flashback to a quote that was, at least in my mind, attributed to Mark Twain, though I gather the real person to say it first was a guy named Charles Warner. But anyway, the line is, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Truth is, everybody's talking in one way or another about this authoritarian populism problem. But not many people are doing anything about it, except maybe trying to work things out so they mobilize the base for their side and they win the next election. We need to get past that. And that's what we're trying to do with massively parallel peace building. There's, there's a sort of broad set of theoretical ideas. Then we get down to an action list of specific things that need to happen. So in the next post, we're going to go through this action list and try to highlight just a few of the things that really have to be dealt with if we're going to get a handle on this authoritarian populism problem.